I think I'll throw the next one right into your lap, Mr. Curran. If you don't mind. Uh, this one comes to us uh, from Mrs. Mary and Clara Carroll, 3557 70th Street, Jackson Heights, New York. Now, they must have worked on this together. Now, Mr. Curran, uh, perhaps someone told you. You're a sports editor, I believe. No, just a common hired hand. Well, someone must have told you, Mr. Curran, in your capacity as common hired hand, that there's going to be a fight tomorrow night between Schmeling and Lewis. Uh-oh. Have you heard of it? I have. Good. Slightly. Now, uh, <clears throat> if a sports writer, or a common hired hand, characterized tomorrow's bout between Schmeling and Lewis as an example of psionarchy, S-C-I-O-M-A-C-H-Y, psionarchy, what would he mean? I'd have to look up in a dictionary first to find out. <laughs> well, we might do that on some other program, but we can't do it on tonight. Well, it looks like there goes five dollars. Five dollars is right. Well, they're starting beautifully, folks. They're starting beautifully to see. Uh, uh, come as you go. <laughs> Mr. Adams likes to throw away Mr. Kieran's five dollars. Uh, any uh, volunteers on what psionarchy would mean? S C I O M A C H Y. Sounds like a name in a rural comedy. <laughs> no, though it's a good guess. Psionarchy means a. How about you, Mr. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. <laughs> psionarchy is a futile or mock battle, a contest with a shadow, a visionary battle. Now, Mr. Chair, I suppose we stop this entire program for a couple of minutes, and let's get down to something really serious. Who's going to win that fight tomorrow night? Are you asking me? I am asking you. I have five dollars. Can you trust me? No, no, certainly not. Well, I don't blame you. I think Joe Lewis is going to win, so you'd better bet on the count. Ladies and gentlemen of the radio audience, we're giving you an inside tip direct from Mr. John Kern of the New York Times. Joe Lewis is going to win tomorrow evening. Thank you. <laughs> Our next question. We did ring up $5 on that, didn't we? Next question. We ring up five on this one, too, maybe. Uh, next... <laughs> <laughs> next one comes to us also from Brooklyn, New York, from Miss Florence Mendelssohn of 120 East 19th Street. Now, attend to this very carefully, gentlemen. It's rather complicated. The following nine numbers appear in the titles of well-known books. Can you mention six of these nine titles? We'll take them one at a time, and you can all club together on it. The first one is 1,001. Volunteers? Mr. Adams. Knights. 1,001 Knights is correct. Uh, the next is five. Mr. Adams. Five little peppers and how they grow. <laughs> Wasn't that cute, folks? You should have seen Mr. Adams' face. Or maybe not, maybe not. Uh, the next is three. That should be fairly easy. A title with the word three in it. Soldier. Soldiers three. Soldiers three. Any uh, other volunteers? Any other... Uh... Three soldiers. Oh, very good. <laughs> now, do you take you on that way, Mr. Chairman? <laughs> yes. Three soldiers, three volunteers. Pardon? Three's the crowd. Three's the crowd. Very good. Three men on a horse. <laughs> three men. <laughs> That's enough. Let's get on to another number. They know they're three. How about uh, 20,000? Mr. Kieran. Burns. 20,000 leagues under the sea. That's correct. And how about uh, seven? Mr. D. House of the Seven Gables. House of the Seven Gables. Very good. Metro Star. No answer. <laughs> now let's go up a few million. Uh, 400 million. Uh, Mr. Adams. Guinea pigs. 400. Guinea pigs is quite wrong. Guinea pigs. No, uh, 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 that Chinese book yes, written what's by that 400 million customers. 400 million customers is correct. Well, that's one wrong so far. Now, uh, one half. One half. Uh, Mr. Jaffe. Half a loaf. Half a loaf is perfectly all right. I don't suppose you would allow uh, Ernest Hemingway to half and half not, would you? No. no. <laughs> not tonight. <laughs> Uh, how about... I wrote a book called Half a Loaf, Much Obliged. Well, that was Mr. Adams advertising his book. Uh, that was Mr. Jaffe advertising Mr. Adams' book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must say, the boys again get this evening as never before, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, one. One in a million. Is that a book? 
I or don't just know. the phrase you thought of. <laughs> Mr. Adams. One by waiting. <laughs> What am I going to do with a man like Mr. Adams who says one by waiting? By, Nance, by Edna Lyle. <laughs> wouldn't get his birth and death date. Her birth and death date. No. Maybe live that. for all I know. Mr. Adams is very reticent this evening. Well, we'll have to allow that. How about one life, one copay? There's one. Now, the last one <laughs> is the number 40. 40. Uh, now, just a minute, boys. Just a minute, Mr. Jaffe. Life begins at 40. Life begins at 40 is correct. Or would you possibly admit the two volumes of 20 years after by Dumas? <laughs> well, I think they got by on that one. Next question comes to us from Mrs. Donald E. Carlson, 59427 Street, Oakland, California. This is a scientific question, very educational indeed. Question. Sound waves travel at different rates of speed through water, through air, and through steel. Arrange them in the proper order, beginning with the one through which sound travels fastest. Well, I think... That's Mr. Jaffe, your students are listening to you this evening, Mr. I Jaffe. Know, Be careful. My, my heart is quivering right now. I think uh, sound travels fastest in steel. Correct. And slowest in uh, air. That's correct, with water in between. Very yeah. nice. Yes. Now, uh, Mr. Deese, how would you like to lead off on this one? <clears throat> this comes from uh, Mr. A. D. Hoteling, 17 and a half East Robinson Avenue, Orlando, Florida. Question. Name four families that have been represented on the screen by actors of two generations. Four families that have been represented on the screen by actors of two generations. That makes about eight generations in all, as far as I can figure out. Fairbanks. Fairbanks is correct. Barrymore's. Barrymore's. Uh, uh, Bushman. Bushman? Now, who are the two generations? Francis X. Bushman and Francis X. Bushman, Jr. So you've got me there. I'm sure that's quite correct, though. Next. Uh, and Tyrone Power. Power. Right. There are two, ty two powers. That's quite correct. Uh, any other volunteers? That's four. Mr. Adams, can you give us one or two more, just for the fun of it? I wouldn't know. Any uh, volunteers? The Costellos. Would that be right, Mr. Deeks? Yes. There are a couple yes. of Costellos. Maurice and then Helen and... Yes. Don't tell us all about your friends. A couple of Beerys, <laughs> a couple of Bennets. That's correct. The... How about Will Rogers? I beg pardon, Mr. Will Jeff. Rogers. Will Rogers was very... Uh, Mary. Sorry. Mary Rogers. Oh, yes, Mary Rogers. We're doing very well this evening. <laughs> Boys are giving us a lot of free information. The next one comes to us from Mr. Baynard H. Kendrick, 129 West 10th Street, New York City. Question. Give the name of the dog, the name, not the breed, associated with any four of the following. And I'm going to name five altogether. One, the Barrett's of Wimple Street. Two, Little Orphan Annie. I'll go through these again, gentlemen. Three, the Thin Man. Four, the Yale football team. And five, Mickey Mouse. The name of the dog. Associated with any four of the following. Can we collaborate? Yes, you can collaborate. Uh, Mr. Adams. Well, the first is Flush. The first is Flush for the Barrett's of Wimpole Street. That's correct. Can you uh, name him in any order? The thin man is Aston. Uh, perfectly correct. That gives us two. Well, the Mr. Eli dog was uh, Bingo. No, the Eli dog was not Bingo. Well, then I've been grossly deceived. So one of us has been deceived. The Eli dog is... Handsome Dan. Handsome Dan, Mr. Adams. Quite correct. <laughs> now we have uh, two more to go. A little off and Annie. A little off and Annie. Nobody heard that, I hope. Something come up. A big pardon, Mr. Deep? No. Don't know? Don't know. Don't know. No. You're an honest man, Mr. Deep. Oh, we may invite you again. <laughs> now, how about Mickey Mouse? Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse. Well, I don't know what the question is. The dog connected with Mickey Mouse. The name oh, of the dog uh, connected with Mickey Mouse. Begins with a B. <laughs> begins with a B. Bingo. Mr. Deets, ladies and gentlemen, connected with a motion stick. Well, it's Pluto. 
Isn't that correct? Yes. And I'm afraid we have to ring up five dollars on that. Going to Mr. Kendrick. Thank you very much. Didn't do so very well on that dog question. Next one. From Mr. Doyle W. Hunsaker. Three eight three. Three six Haverhill Drive, Toledo, Ohio. Mr. Hunsaker wants to know which can see best in total darkness: a bat, an owl, or a leopard. Which can see best in total darkness: a bat, an owl, or a leopard? I don't think it's going to be turned. I don't know how. I don't know how it could be turned. You don't know how you could determine. I know that they all see better in the darkness than uh, than we do, than humans do. Well, that's perfectly correct. But listen to the way the question's worded. Which can see best in total darkness? A bat, an owl, or a leopard? Mr. Adams. <laughs> a leopard. A leopard can see best in no, total darkness. No. Then why? Because I don't think the question would be asked otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> No, that's incorrect. That was a very nice guess on your part. I don't think that's going to cost us five dollars. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wow, it's so fast. Oh, no. That must be answered yeah, by one man. That was answered. Yes. Uh, that's uh, not a uh, part question. I think I can answer it now, though. Mr. Jack. I Come think, uh, think none of them can really see that's it all. That's, that's quite correct. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Jaffe, why is none of them can see? Well, darkness is the absence of light, and you can't see anything unless there is light. And why didn't you tell us that a minute or two ago? Because Mr. Adams oh. stole it from me. <laughs> Another minute or two won't be able to control this board, folks. They're fighting. Well, the next question is a literary question. Maybe we can get Mr. Adams on this one. Uh, this comes from Dr. August A. Tomen of 867 Madison Avenue, New York City. It's a very gloomy question. This is the last stanza of a frequently quoted poem. There is room in the halls of pleasure for a, lo a long and lordly train, but one by one we must all file on through the narrow aisles of pain. That's a fine question for a doctor to send in. Now, can uh, any of you quote a few lines from the first stanza of the poem of which those lines form the last I don't think this is easy myself. Can't do it, Mr. Rapp. Can't do it. Mr. D, can you no, do it? No, I can't. I've, I've got limitations. <laughs> Mr. Karen? No, sir, I have inhibitions. <laughs> Jackie, what have you got to say? I've got literary ignorance. <laughs> Boys are all diseased. Galloping. Well, the poem... That is the first answer of the poem from uh, which that's quoted, is the following. Laugh and the world laughs with you. Weep <laughs> and you weep alone. For this sad old earth must borrow its mirth, but has trouble enough of its own. Mr. Adams, who wrote that poem? Ella Wheeler Wilcox. I know that. Five dollars, oh. however. Thank you very Glad much. Glad I didn't know it. And now the total record of penalties so far indicates that we have lost, among us, doing very well, too, twenty-five dollars. We'll go on now to the next question. <laughs> this comes from Paul Murphy of Cleveland, Ohio. Identify the following personalities of sport by these nicknames. One, Pack Ramsey. One, uh, two, Rabbit Maranville. Three, Mile a Minute Murphy. Four, Needle Eye Murgler. Uh, Karen, how do you feel about that? I think I can answer them. Uh, I don't have to answer them in that order, do no, I? No, no, no. Take any order. Well, with. Tack Ramsey was the president of the United States Golf Association, and he was called Tack because when, when he was at Yale, he had a big brother who was called Spike. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I have no means of checking uh, Mr. Sharon on that. <laughs> Probably perfectly correct. And well, he, right, how about Robert Marinville, Mr. Sharon? Well, I'll save the rabbit. I, I, I know I'm sure about him. And Needle, I... Uh, Needle Eye Murgler. Murgler. Yeah. He's a jockey, and he's called Needle Eye Murgler because he uh, used to go through holes along the rail no bigger than the eye of a needle. I believe he's still riding steeplechase. Uh, mile a Minute Murphy was a bike rider. He was so called because uh, he rode a mile in a minute behind a railroad train over a, a plank track. What railroad? 
Uh, the BMO. <laughs> and uh, Rabbit Moranville, well, there's some dispute. That's why I saved him for the fourth. There's some dispute as to why he was called Rabbit Moranville. Of course, he's a well-known baseball player. And I heard him explaining to Leo DeRocha of the Brooklyn Dodgers why he was called a rabbit. He said because he was small and fast and full of pepper. And Leo said to him, you sure it wasn't on account of those ears? <laughs> I think we owe Mr. Jerns five dollars. There's no way of bringing that up. Though. I think I'll toss the next one right into your lap, Mr. Dietz, if that's all right with you. This comes from uh, Miss Jean Oliver of Chicago, Illinois. What young trio that gave promise at best of becoming hams defied all expectation by dancing and singing their way to fame? Now, be careful of libel, Mr. Dietz. There are a number of people listening to you this evening. What young trio that gave promise at best of becoming hams defied all expectation by dancing and singing their way to fame? Trio. Trio, you know, that's one, two, three. Yeah. I think I've got them, folks, on this one. What's more, the theater audience, audience doesn't know either. Something that only God can make, isn't it? No, the Green Bay Trio. <laughs> What'd you say about that trio? Something that only God can make? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is not an answer, at best. Well, well gentlemen, nice. you give up, I assume. The young trio that gave promise at best can of I becoming hands. Uh, I beg pardon? Can I try it? Yes, Mr. We've Jeff. lost five dollars anyway, so I can... All right. No, uh, you... Oh, we have it? Right. What's, what's yours? No, I, I, anyone can answer it. Well, have they all given up? Oh, sure. Look at their faces. <laughs> Mr. Jeff. Maybe it was the three Marx brothers before they became four. No, that's not no, no, true. No, they didn't. They're not dancing. No, boys. The uh, young trio that gave promise at best of becoming hams were the three little pigs. <laughs> Got them on that. That's five dollars. Thank you. Robbery. Now they're tricked. <laughs> they feel pretty sore, folks, about that one. Now we go on from ham to eggs. This comes from Mr. Ed Bowden, 151 Fifth Avenue of the city. Question. Two sets of campers, one on the seacoast and one on a rather high mountain, drop eggs into boiling water. Which campers will get hard-boiled eggs first? Well, let's see. That, uh, that sounds rather hard-boiled. Well, what can you well, do I, with it, Mr. I Jeffrey? think I can unscramble that. All right. Let's see. <laughs> I think that the <clears throat> fellow who drops the egg in boiling water at sea, sea level will have that egg boil first. Why would that because be? Because the boiling point of water at sea level is higher than the boiling point of water at top of the mountain. That sounds quite right to me, and that's what it says on this card. That must be correct. <laughs> Next question from Mr. Donald S. Plop of 33 Waverly Place, Red Bank, New Jersey. I think this is a pretty easy one. Let's try it. Suppose you are making a literary tour of the country. That's this country. Name the writers for whose sakes you would visit each of the following places. I'll name them one at a time. Walden Pond, Massachusetts. Mr. Henry. Kieran. D. Thoreau. That was Mr. Adams answering to Mr. Kieran. <laughs> uh, Nick, Salk, Santa, Minnesota. Raise your hand quick, Mr. Kieran. No, I'll give that to him. <laughs> Mr. H. Sinclair Lewis. H. Sinclair Lewis is correct. Hannibal, Missouri. Mr. Kieran. Uh, fellow who wrote <laughs> Huckleberry Finn and uh, Mark Twain. <laughs> Mark Twain, <laughs> yeah. It'll come to you after a while. Atlanta, Georgia. Mr. Adams? Joel Chandler Harris. I haven't sat down here, but that's probably quite correct. I'm sure that is correct. Uh, Margaret Mitchell or Ishton Caldwell would be equally good, I imagine, as an answer. Uh, Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> Brooklyn, New York, if you don't mind. Miss Adams? Walt Whitman. <laughs> Walt Whitman is correct. And the last uh, that I have down on the list here is that uh, famous place made famous by uh, Ogden Nash's immortal couplet. The Bronx, no thunks. The Bronx, not the Cobra. Not the Cobra is perfectly correct. Uh, any other I would go to see things? John Kieran myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
John, correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I think you're wrong this time. I take Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan Poe is correct. Well, I think we can say that that question is answered quite correctly. For well, Mr. Donald S. Clark with Waverly Place, Red Bank, New Jersey. Next question comes from Mr. Edward T. Lauer, 409 Parklow Street, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Question. Well, rather, I'll put this in the form of a situation. Boy meets girl. Girl develops taste for liliaceous bulbs. Liliaceous. L-I-L-I-A-C-E-A-U-S. Bulbs. Oh, you know bulbs. A uh, boy leaves girl. According to this story, why did boy leave girl? Mr. Chair. Because he's like me. He didn't like onions. That's correct. <laughs> uh, what's the meaning of liliaceous bulb? Well, a uh, liliaceous bulb is a bulb of the order, uh, the, the variety that uh, lilies are grown from. The onion is a member of the lily family, as a matter of fact. Yes, that's very kind of you to give us that information. <laughs> that's correct. Okay, we can get a few more in. This one comes from Brooklyn, New York, from P.A. Taylor, 2313 Avenue Z. Name the movies in which the following played important parts. Now, I'm going to name uh, seven, and we'll have to get five out of the seven. The following objects played important parts. One, an apple. In what movie did an apple play an important part? Oh, well, that's easy. Miss Kieran. Uh, Snow White. That's correct. A red dress. The bride wore red. Uh, was there a red dress? Yes, the bride wore red. red. Correct. A wad of gum. A wad of gum. Gum. I know a picture is very old and probably not right for that answer, but the picture will scratch my back. <laughs> Well, you've got me there. That may be true. The uh, picture that I have down here is an MGM picture. You work for Metro Golden, oh, yeah. don't you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's Test it's Pilot. Test Pilot. There is a wad of gum in Test Pilot, I believe. Yes, there is. All right. That's uh, one wrong or possibly right. For the airplane. Now, uh, mosquitoes. That's mosquitoes. Yellow Jack. Yellow Jack. He knows that one. An MGM picture also. Uh, a uh, hat box. Mannequin. There a hat box in Madison? Yes. All right. <laughs> and uh, grapefruit? <laughs> grapefruit? I suppose there's a picture named Grapefruit. <laughs> <laughs> are you boys trying to bluff me out of this? I have a whole set of different answers down on my card. <laughs> grapefruit, grapefruit. Anyone of you remember a very famous picture? Life of Luther Redman. Don't guess, don't guess. How about grapefruit? Well, it was public enemy number one. Don't you remember the famous picture in which uh, a uh, man assaulted a woman for the first time in motion pictures and got away with it? Quite correct. And uh, finally, uh, Mr. Dietz, a tuba. <laughs> a tuba at T-U-B-A. T-U-B-A. Thought it was an onion for a minute. Well, Mr. Uh, Deep, you're not going to town on that one. Our tuba. Green pasture. No. <laughs> they have one in there. They do have a tuba in green pasture. Hamlet. A tuba in Hamlet? <laughs> tuba or not tuba? <laughs> Five I think that's all the questions we'll have time for tonight, ladies and gentlemen. And now for the final penalty. The kitty's been reduced by the round, extremely round sum, of $30. Not bad business. Thank you all, members of the board, and thank you all the folks that have submitted questions. And now Mr. Cross has a word for you about next week's contest. Good night, everybody, and come again. Thank you, Mr. Fadiman. We meet again next week at 8.30 for another quiz contest between the public and the experts. The board of experts for next week will include Franklin P. Adams, John Kieran, Marcus Duffield, and guest of honor, Mrs. Carmel Snow, editor of Harper's Bazaar and authority on half the human race, women. Send us your questions and don't forget to include the correct answers. There are no restrictions on the number you may submit. For each question chosen, you get $2. Then if the board flops on that question, you get $5 more. All questions become the property of information, please. Questions on all subjects are welcomed. History, sports, literature, music, science, movies, and so on. 
make the questions interesting and amusing on subjects the experts should know and the public would like to learn about. So come on, everybody, join our new game of quizzing and stumping the experts and send your questions to information, please, 